Let's, let's meet our panel. With us here in the studio, Roberto Braga is an Associate Director for the Latin America Center at the Atlantic Council. Joining us from London, Gilson Schwartz is an economics professor at the University of Sao Paulo. The economist and author Rodrigo Constantino joins us from Miami. And David Nima is a professor of media studies at the University of Virginia, joining us from Charlottesville. Welcome to all of you. Gilson Schwartz, let me start with you and let's start with the economy and look at Bolsonaro's record. He took office a year ago when the country was just coming out of a recession and unemployment was very high. Uh, the economy has improved, but as we heard from one of our analysts in that report, it hasn't seeped down to people, the ordinary people in Brazil. What is your assessment? Well, I think that uh, from an economic perspective, we are really, of course, we have to think about the, the Bolsonaro initial period in, in power. But as a matter of fact, we have been going through what I would call a kind of meso sad economics for four or five years. Uh, we must remember that uh, even Dilma Rousseff was already engaging the country in recessive adjustment. So we are now almost five years through uh, budget cuts and a very slow reduction of interest rates, very, very high unemployment. So the economy hasn't recovered. Remember that President Temer already said that he was building a bridge to the future, and everyone expected that once the Workers' Party was out of power, the economy would boom. It would be like a new miracle. So we are still waiting for that miracle. Maybe we are now in a moment that we could call the economy in vertigo. You know, the, the film Democracy in Vertigo is now in the headlines and has been nominated for an Oscar. Maybe we should think about the Brazilian economy in vertigo. Now, almost five years of recessive policies and no growth in sight, except for this really, I know, of course, uh, many people are enthusiastic about uh, what's going on now. Yeah. It's basically a reaction of capital markets. Right. Gilson, those budget cuts that you talk about, what kind of impact have they had on the country? Well, basically depressing expectations. And, uh, and, and of course, the markets are always willing to see budget cuts and the austerity seems to many people to be a magic word that will solve everything. Right. But as a matter of fact, we have seen very high interest rates and very high unemployment. So the, the recovery that we are seeing now is very, very fragile. Yeah. It's based on uh, low level, low skilled employment. And even the low interest rates now face a situation where the, the state expenditures are lacking and the, the, the country is actually deteriorating. The infrastructures are deteriorating. David Niemeyer, if we look at Bolsonaro's uh, political performance in his first year, he came to office with support from across the political spectrum, from liberals as well as ultra-conservatives. Has he been able to hold that coalition in his first year? No, he hasn't. In fact, um, he actually failed in continuing some of the things that he advertised during his campaign, um, but he hasn't been able to hold up to his promises. Uh, as Gilberto mentioned, um, one of the biggest promise of his campaign in his first months of government was to actually get the economy to move forward and to perform really well, which was actually a big disappointment. Unemployment is a huge rate, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a huge problem, um, still in rates of 11.6%. Inflation went up to 4.31%. Um, the GDP and industrial um, production growth rates also stayed very low at approximately 1%. And the uh, devaluation of real also set a new record in November uh, with uh, the dollar costing 4.26 uh, reais. Um, in the areas of education, environment, and human rights, the government was just disastrous. Uh, mm -hmm. Bolsonaro declare an open warfare against higher education, imposing several major budget cuts that uh, uh, led to the cancellation of uh, stipends and scholarships of researchers throughout Brazil. Um, Bolsonaro literally created the Amazon crisis from beginning to end in the beginning because he stopped funding some of the agencies and N NGOs that took care of continuing the fire as well as yeah. monitoring uh, deforestation of the forest. Okay. And what is mostly interesting is that he ran on a campaign of fighting uh, corruption, mm -hmm. but the biggest story of 2019 involved his son, yeah. Flavio Bolsonaro, 
who was under investigation by the prosecutors in Rio de Janeiro for a huge scam on money laundering right. and misuse of public funds, which means that he was funneling uh, some of the taxpayers' money to pay members of the militia in Rio de Janeiro. All so right, this is let all me uh, investigation. Yeah, Rodrigo, let me come to you on that uh, last point that uh, David Nima just raised, and that is corruption. Uh, Bolsonaro took office, promising to stamp out corruption, but as we just heard, uh, his one of his sons was implicated in a corruption scandal. Bolsonaro, in fact, tried to bury that. Another one of his sons, uh, he tried to appoint as U.S. Uh, as the ambassador to the United States. Uh, what happened to the anti-corruption drive? Well, it's not the same as it used to be before, but there's no huge scandal in the government in the first year. That's important, very important to mention. And there's, there's, there's a difference now uh, from what was going on before. Uh, the government, the relation uh, of the executive power and Congress is a different one. There's no uh, uh, monthly payment to, to buy support, for example. So it's a very different issue. Uh, the scandal regarding the president's son is before the election. It's something that bothers uh, a lot of his supporters. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Ministro, the minister Sergio Moro is still there, and he's a very important symbol in terms of fighting corruption in the government. Rodrigo, what, uh, about the, uh, what about the point that David raised about one of the sons diverting tax, tax money to pay off militias? Yeah, exactly. That was before the election. Uh, the, I, I think there are some signs that the government, uh, the, the president himself, is trying to get away from this uh, anti-corruption uh, uh, fight because of that. So he, he put some, some people in power in some strategic, strategic positions yeah. that are not exactly a very anti-corruption uh, message yeah so people are, are, are worried about it but uh, there's no huge scandal in the government okay so let me uh, all point. right let me get a very quick response from David Nima David very quickly and then I want to move on oh um, yes it was a it was a something that happened in the past but it's an ongoing practice the so-called Russia Jian, to believe that this is no longer happening it's uh, yeah. wishful thinking uh, maybe he stopped right now because he got caught by the prosecutors, but uh, it's an ongoing process that um, he still managed to continue. Right. And, and remember, the campaign was all about anti-corruption, and he was still engaged in these practices. Yeah. So it's very hypocritical. All right, let's uh, come to the studio, to Roberta. Roberta, let's talk about foreign policy. Uh, one of Bolsonaro's goals has been to improve the relationship with the United States. He's been here to the White House. He's mm -hmm. visited with uh, President Trump. Uh, now we see the United States is supporting Brazil's bid to become a member of the OECD. In fact, it's put Brazil ahead of Argentina and Romania. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see this relationship? So, Presidents Trump and Bolsonaro have a lot in common. As we've seen throughout the year, they tend to agree on different topics of foreign policy. Um, they tend to have a similar vision of uh, economic growth and development, and they seem to agree that the U.S.-Brazil relationship is a priority for both of them, and deepening that trade and foreign direct investment relationship would benefit both of their populations. And so, um, President Trump's uh, uh, supporting Brazil's bid to the OECD is something that Brazil expected to happen this year or into 2019. Um, it's a positive symbol that will reassure investors looking to invest in Brazil that Brazil is able, capable of making the necessary reforms to be to um, exceed into the OECD. Um, and I think that is a signal that President Trump will continue to support President Bolsonaro. But going into 2020, um, Brazil will face municipal elections, yes. which will um, really determine Bolsonaro's support um, and throw into question some of the promises that he has made. And President Trump will face elections here as well. And so I think when it comes to prioritizing the relationship, since both presidents will be facing domestic pressure, mm -hmm. um, we'll see an interesting development, especially from the U.S. side, right. on whether President Trump will continue to support Brazil. Would it be fair to say that uh, the improving relationship with the United States has been good for Brazil? Yes, absolutely. So I think that um, Brazil's 
approximation of the United States has yeah. been um, a long time coming. They have a strong relationship dating back decades. Yeah. Um, but I think that this year, um, that symbolic approximation and working together, especially around trade, discussions on initiating a free trade agreement between both countries, which is a long-term goal, but one that would benefit both countries immensely, um, really shows that there's a lot to accomplish if yeah. the two countries can continue aligning, especially on the economic side. Gelson Schwartz, uh, there's of course been a lot of diplomatic activity here in Washington over the past 24 hours. We had the Chinese Vice Premier Liu He here signing phase one of the trade deal uh, with Donald Trump. Um, they'll now start working on phase two. But looking at phase one, how is that going to impact Brazil, which of course is a very important trading partner with China as well? Well, if you don't mind, just going back, uh, just one remark uh, with yeah. respect to corruption or huge corruption sure. cases, because we have to be honest, we have to really at least read the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And we have two very important corruption scandals that are still going on under investigation in the first year of Bolsonaro's government. The first one is at the Ministry of Education. There's a big fight in the Ministry of Education, and there's been changes also in the top positions in the Ministry of Education. Uh, basically, there has been a very, very important issue related to buying computer equipment for schools in Brazil. This is a huge expenditure that would use the National Education Fund for the development of education. This is still under investigation. It's not a big scandal in the papers. It's not out in the media as maybe the Petrobras case was in the past. Yeah. But it's a huge, huge issue because it deals with the Ministry of Education and it deals with large expenditure, large expenditure of public funds for buying uh, computers for schools. This is one huge uh, scandal involving corruption. Of course, uh, there's been a fight in the Ministry of Education. And the other one, uh, very recent, it's in the headlines this week. The, the, the very person responsible for communication of the presidency has been now uh, accused, and it seems to be fairly evident, that he's still uh, running a company in the media sector, mm. and he's uh, doing business with media companies while he is the secretary of communication to the presidency. All right. Can you imagine that in the Workers' Party uh, government? He was actually money to his All right, own Gilson, company that uh, was one of the higher... Yeah, David, I will get to you in a moment. Uh, Gilson, um, I'll give you a chance to get back to what we were talking about earlier on the China trade deal, but let me give Rodrigo a chance here to respond to what you've just said. Rodrigo, we just heard yeah, this about is what's scandalous. Yeah, we just heard about what's going Hi. on in the Ministry of Education as well as the, the President's Secretary for Communication. Uh, it's just absurd. It's not a very Republican thing to do, but there's nothing illegal there. There's no crime committed. There's no punishment. Uh, if you compare that to Petrolon, uh, the scandal of corruption in Petrobras, it's just absurd. It makes no yeah. sense at all. Uh, so I think it's a, a, only a, an ideological uh, stance. Okay. It doesn't make sense at all. All right, David, you want to say something? Go ahead. Yes, I think we should not normalize any sort of misdoing and misuse of public money. Yes, what happened with Petrolon was awful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's much in a bigger, higher impact than what is happening now. But you cannot run on a platform of honesty and yeah. fighting corruption and still allowing that to happen in the government. It's not acceptable. Even if it's a small case, okay. it should not be part of the public domain. All right, let me go back to Rodrigo. Rodrigo, uh, the China trade deal and its impact on Brazil. Okay, there is, there is some impact, of course. If China is going to be buying more from U.S., it means less from Brazil, maybe $10 billion, I don't yeah. know. But it's good for the world. Okay. We don't want a trade war. A trade war would be uh, bad for everyone involved. So I think it's still better for, for Brazil that China is getting along finally with the U.S. It, it's good news. Right. Uh, Gilson, what is your view on that? Well, I, I'm very skeptical about what has been just announced. I mean, it's also, uh, let's say, phase one. It's more or less like uh, it's uh, this old joke that uh, the guy who went to the to his uh, yeah. psychoanalyst and said he had lot of, lots of trouble, and the and the doctor said, oh, okay, just bring a goat into your living room. And he said, what? A goat in my living room? Yes, bring a goat in the living room. So he did that for a month, and he came back to the doctor and said, now take the goat out of the living room, and he said, yes, I did it, and now oh, it's wonderful. So it's like that. Trump initiated a fake trade war, and now what we see is that he's taking the goat out of the living room. But that doesn't mean that key issues are being faced, especially 
the Huawei issue, the, the pressure, the lobby that the U.S. government is putting on especially European governments, here in the U.K., this is yeah. a big issue, not to buy, not to go to the 5G wave of telecommunications uh, using Huawei technology, for instance. So I think that the big issues here are still undiscussed. Yeah. And this will come later, for sure, after the election. I see the phase one agreement as basically a political maneuver yeah. by President Trump that doesn't solve the big issues. And it's like solving a problem that he himself created. Yeah, okay. Roberto, I want to change direction a bit here and talk about uh, Bolsonaro's support base and his style of government. Uh, he has the support of evangelicals in Brazil. In fact, his catchphrase has been, Brazil above everything, God above all. Uh, a judge in Brazil recently ordered Netflix, a very popular streaming service, uh, to uh, stop a comedy which portrayed Jesus as being gay. That decision was subsequently overturned by the country's Supreme Court. Uh, but talking about evangelicals, how big an influence have they had on this government in its first year? I would say that just as they were incredibly influential during the election cycle, I would say that they've also been an important base for Bolsonaro and will continue to be. Um, this is a growing group of people in Brazil. Um, they have a lot to say and they're putting pressure on the president to meet the expectations that he laid out for them mm -hmm. in the election cycle. And so when it comes to everything from reforms to ideology, they'll continue pushing for what um, they view as appropriate government action. Um, but absolutely groups like the evangelicals will continue to influence and I think they'll also influence the munici municipal elections as well. You know, one of the things we did see in Brazil, Roberta, and that is uh, we saw the officers of that very same comedy group uh, on Netflix, they were attacked and then there were attacks uh, at the store of someone who supports Bolsonaro. Mm -hmm. What does this tell us about political polarization in Brazil? It's only getting more polarized every yeah. day. Um, we, again, saw that in the 2018 elections. The Atlantic Council did a study on disinformation yeah. and narrative spread during the elections, and we found that it was spreading through polarized lines domestically. Um, and we continue to see that today. And instances like this just show that um, the middle ground is no longer satisfactory. Facts don't convince people anymore. Narratives and stories convince people. And so um, Brazil, unfortunately, I think, continues to be polarized. And we'll likely see that play out again at the local level during the municipal elections in right. October. Right, David Nima, you know, a lot of uh, comparisons have been made between Bolsonaro and Donald Trump. They share many of the same things. Uh, one of those things is how they reach their supporters. They both are users of social media. Uh, they bypass traditional media using social media to get their message across. Has it worked for him in Brazil? Oh yes, the way that he communicates with his base is very effective. Um, he actually uses uh, Twitter and his audience as a test bed mm -hmm. to everything he wants to propose. Uh, he goes out on Twitter and say to see the reaction of what the fan base will say and also to get their base on the same page as him. So if there's someone, for example, in Congress that is somehow uh, blocking something that he wants to pass, he will go to Twitter and out that person so the, 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 his base can go against this person. So it's a very uh, effective um, st strategy. In fact, he capitalizes a lot on the strategy of us versus them, mm -hmm. being us, uh, the traditional Brazilian, the nationalists, the patriots, the Christians, whereas them are the, the leftists, the feminists, the communists. And by creating this, um, this enemy that he keeps trying to do with not only those in the left, but also uh, celebrities like Leonardo DiCaprio yeah. and also foreign uh, politicians like Macron, he can keep his base in check because he keeps uh, saying that these actors, these, these enemies, are there to destroy the nation and destroy him. You want to say something? Yes, I would just add that, that, that that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, we're seeing that play out in different examples this year. Um, especially on the social side. Yeah. Um, it's a very similar situation to what happened here in the United States with President Trump and continues to happen where um, they build, the president's leadership are building a narrative on social media first um, and advancing it there early and where people aren't consuming traditional news anymore or not to the same extent yeah. they used to. Um, they go to more polarized um, 
hyper news sites yeah. or blogs and they get the uh, the assertions that they already believe reconfirmed in those places yeah. and those tend to match the narratives on we social media. We see a lot media. of that in the United States too, yes. don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Rodrigo, well, uh, of course the president has found a very effective way to communicate with his supporters but let's look at his approval rating. It's pretty low, it's 30 percent. It had a high at one stage just a few months ago of 49 percent. Um, of, and now we say 30% of Brazilians are rating his administration as good or great. Uh, some analysts uh, are saying that he's, al he's alienated his moderate supporters. We just heard uh, David tell us about one of the bizarre statements he made about Leonardo DiCaprio being responsible for the uh, Amazon forest fires. Do you, does he need to control that rhetoric to attract more support? I think he should. Uh, <laughs> the moderates are getting uh, uh, far away from him because of all that. But the economy is doing fine. It's going to grow like 2.5% 2, 2 the GDP this year uh, with the reforms. The pension fund reform was the, the star last year. So uh, he, he's, he's going to count on that, just as Trump here in the United States. And he's going to count on the polarization as well. Because if it's him again against uh, Lula the, in the Labour Party, that's all he wants. Because the moderates will have to go with him again without an alternative. Yeah, and so Rodrigo, uh, in fact, Lula uh, at a rally he addressed, and this was a few months ago in November, said he's going to make life hell for uh, Bolsonaro. Yeah, that's, that's his option as well. He needs uh, Bolsonaro, and Bolsonaro needs him alive as a political uh, player because they both, uh, wants, uh, they, they both want that tribalism, the polarization that's going on right now in, in the country. So they don't want uh, any moderate center to right or center to left option. That would be bad for both of them. So Bolsonaro knows that, and they, he needs to keep the base uh, very, very agitated and, yeah. and fighting for him. That's why he, this rhetoric he uses. Right. Gilson Schwartz, of course, Bolsonaro, as we just mentioned, very low approval ratings. He's also got internal political problems. He broke away from his own political party and he now wants to create a new political party. But looking ahead to his second year, if he maintains, as Rodrigo says, a 2.5% growth rate, is that going to be enough? Well, uh, this expectation of a 2.5% uh, growth, of course, is uh, under discussion right now by many, many economists. And we have to take into account that it's a comparative rate uh, relate, relating to a long period, I say, I've already said, almost five years of a recession. So we are not going very much in terms of uh, generating employment if you are growing a little bit in face of a huge stock of unemployment and social problems and the destruction of the infrastructure in the right. country. I'm here in London. I'm here in London. I visited yesterday uh, the Imperial War Museum. There's a very interesting exhibition about the Holocaust. And what really struck me in that exhibition is the use of hate speech and propaganda as the main instrument for generating the mm. divisions in society that favor authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. Right. This is very dangerous. And I don't think that we are in the beginning of a huge recovery, economic recovery. Uh, actually, it's important to state, just based on economic yeah. data, that the economic growth in the United States after Trump is the result not of private investment, not of the reducing government expenditures. Yeah. On the contrary, I would advise everyone here to just look at the data, the data for the, to, for the U.S. economy, yeah. and you'll see that there has been a huge expansion of government expenditure and especially military expenditure. Yeah. This is something that is not open to Brazil. Brazil cannot risk expanding non-productive right. public uh, expenditures. It has to go into higher productivity. And it has to give up that kind of hate speech. We have seen in the past, yeah. after the Second World War, the only way out of totalitarianism is for the liberals and the left, the center-left and the liberals and the democrats, to unite. Otherwise, the hate speech and the propaganda will just generate the illusion of growth, the illusion of employment, but based on violence, okay. based on hate. That will not take us any, any 
to any, any uh, yeah. hopeful scenario okay. in the future. Rodrigo, I've got 20 seconds. I'd like your response to that very quickly, please. Uh, it doesn't make sense at all. The ra hate speech comes from the left as well. Bolsonaro is not a uh, new Hitler or something like this, not even Trump. They, they don't come close to that. Yeah. The economy is doing fine. They're probably going to be re-elected, okay. and that's not bad. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.